And that's what climate change is about. It is literally, not figuratively, a clear and present danger. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. The ability of CO2 to do the heavy work of creating a climate catastrophe is almost nil at this point. The price of oil has been artificially elevated to the point of insanity. That's not how you power a modern industrial system. The ultimate goal of this renewable energy you know, plan is to reach the exact same point that we're at now. You know who's tried that? Germany. Seven straight days of no wind for Germany. Uh, their factories are shutting down. They really do act like weather didn't happen prior to like 1910. Today is Friday. It is Friday and welcome everyone to this number 60 edition of Climate Change Roundtable. Today we're going to take on something called Bacon Bake. I don't know if you, some people of a certain age might get this joke related to a, a product that used to be all the rage in the 60s and 70s, but basically it boils down, that particular product boiled down to the cheapest, most, uh, well, unpalatable way of preparing a meal, yet it was popular. And that's kind of like what's happening in the media today. They're cheap. They take shortcuts when it comes to covering weather and climate, and we're going to talk about that today. We're also going to talk about Earth Day which is coming up tomorrow. Yes, once again, we're all going to pay homage to the planet, you know. How dare and you? we're going to basically talk about what Earth Day has been and what it ha is going to be, which isn't much these days. With us today is our usual panel of usual suspects, uh, Dr. Sterling Burnett and Linnea Lucan, both of which who have some great ideas and opinions, not only about shake and bake, or rather fake and bake, but um, Earth Day as well. Welcome, guys. Hello. I thought Good. we were making a Talladega reference. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good, good to be on. Yeah, no, I remember the shake and bake, they, like meals in a bag. Uh, it, it was like it was like the uh, Jiffy Pop uh, popcorn of meals, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no one does Jiffy Pop anymore because they they throw uh, the popcorn bags in the microwave. But we used to have Jiffy Pop. Right. Yeah. Jiffy Pop was fun to watch, fun to make. Um, but, you know, I'm sure at some point in the future, we'll have a show centering around hamburger helper, too. Maybe tuna <laughs> helper. <laughs> tuna helper. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Anyway, so I want to bring up this first article. We have a, a tweet that showed up the other day from GBN. And GBN is the, the Great Britain News Network. And they sent this tweet out. And my jaw dropped when I saw this. And here's what they're saying. Many heat wave to see Britain's bake in 20 degrees centigrade heat as hot air sweeps in from Europe. Oh, no! I mean, it was just, if anybody knows anything about temperature scales, this is the most mind-boggling statement ever to come out of a news service as far as I'm concerned. I mean, it just, the stupid, it burns. <laughs> so I wrote up a reply on climate realism. And the reply basically says it's misleading. And the reason it's misleading if you'll scroll down just a little bit there, Andy, we have a little graphic from Google. I mean, it's like reporters these days don't know how to use Google. There it is right there. The reason the headline is laughable can be found in this simple Google search. Well, 20 degrees centigrade is 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, if you scroll down just a little bit more, we'll find a nice little graphic that says, hey, that's room temperature. Oh, no. Climate change is making room temperature. Oh, well, you know, the odd thing about that story, uh, the headline just doesn't represent the story at all. Because what they're saying is springs arrived. <laughs> it's, it's not summer temperature. Spring, 68 degrees it might get up to in the coming weeks. And they talked to people from the Met Service and they talked to people from some other weather services over there, and they said, this is overdue. And gosh, this is going to be pleasant weather. 
So the headline made it sound like uh, Britons will be sweltering. They'll be fainting in the streets. Uh, hospital admissions will go up due to the heat wave. And then the story itself said, you know what? We're going to be enjoying some warm weather finally after a long uh, erratic winter. <laughs> so it's like, uh, it just shows how, I don't know if that's the reporter's fault or the editor's fault, because I, I have found uh, when I write, often my headlines are rewritten. But regardless, he didn't object, and uh, or he or she didn't object. I don't know if uh, a man or a woman wrote this report. But uh, there was nothing alarming contained in the news story. The only thing that was slightly alarming was the headline. Yep. Yep. And, you know, but still, the reporter talked about the 20 degrees centigrade, you know. But here's the other thing they did, and this was the real fakery going on. They put in this graphic on the headline, and they said it came from uh, a website called WX Charts. Now, this graphic doesn't have a key. It doesn't have a title. You don't know what it's representing, although it looks hot. It looks like something that just came out of the oven, right? You know? It looks well, yeah, like a bad Jiffy Pop. <laughs> well, if you compare it to, to right? normal... If you compare it to normal weather things, the dark reds are where it's really, really hot and dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. So I went to the same website, WX Charts, and I got their graphic. And if you scroll down a little bit, Andy, you know, yes, there we go. Scroll down a little bit. There it is. Thank you. Look at that. Look at the way that they represent temperature. Yeah. That's no fake and bake at all. That's the real deal. You know, yeah, you can kind of tell from the headline photo, though, that the island is approximately the same temperature as the surrounding Atlantic. So it's, you know, it doesn't really strike me as all that warm compared to water temperature, which is never going to be uh, all that hot anyway, unless you're, you know, in the middle of something like Hawaii or something, then maybe it's a little bit warmer water. But uh, yeah, no, no that was Atlantic that's kind is of not funny. known for no. Uh, uh, yeah. You know, does does that look like Britons will bake in a heat wave? Yeah. <laughs> and that's why we call this show Fake and Bake. It's completely fake what they published there. And then it wasn't just GBN. Some other outlets like the Mirror and so forth picked it up. You know, I, I mean, I've seen a lot of junk come out of the climate community and the media over the past 20 so years. And I got to tell you, this one is the dumbest one I've ever seen. It really is. I mean, 20 degrees centigrade, a heat wave. Ugh. All right. You got to take their color scales away from them or like force them to use a wider scale. That'd be like a child. Treat, treat them like children. Take their crayons away. No more warm <laughs> colors. We're going to take all the warm colors away from you and see how well you're able to peddle this nonsense. Yeah. 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 It, it's just. So quite something. Okay, so we've got some other examples. Uh, we have a website called Climate Realism that we publish on literally every day. And we talk about all of the bad examples that come out of the media, talking about how they cover weather or climate, not just badly, but in some cases, completely incompetently. Um, and so uh, one of the first stories that we're going to cover is about the Washington Post where they claim that tax season in the United States is getting longer due to climate change, right? This guy, yeah. Jacob, Jacob Bogod, he's another guy fresh out of college writing stuff. Basically, they're saying, you know, because there were weather disasters in the U.S., tornadoes and so forth, that some people got a break on their tax filing deadline because the IRS, being the compassionate organization that it is, decided they would give these people an extension for filing. So what does he do? He immediately jumps on the climate change bandwagon. Oh, weather happened. Well, it must be climate change. Boom, there's the logic that goes on. I mean, that, that's the kind of logic the media uses. And of course, we wrote up a response to this on climate realism. And, um, you know, we basically said, this is junk, just absolute junk. And we were able to go in and show that tornadoes are not getting worse, you know, and also point out that weather is not climate. This is one of the things that the media misses far and wide on a regular basis. They see a weather event that might be unusual, and all of a sudden, 
they will come back and say, oh, it's climate change. Well, it's garbage. It's not climate change. It's completely false what they're saying there. And so further down in this article, we have a graph showing tornado activity over the last, uh, you know, a couple of de few decades, from 1954 to 2020. These are EF3 and stronger tornadoes. And this data is directly from the, the NOAA website. And it's just plotted and a trend line is put in there. Look at that. The trend line is straight downward. And even the IPCC says there is no linkage to tornadoes from climate change. And yet media like the Washington Post immediately jump on it and say, well, we had tornadoes that must be climate change. It, it's crazy. I mean, they're even more misleading. The, the, the implication that they have or, you know, what they what they say is, well, the season, this the, the tornado season is getting longer and tornadoes are happening where they've never happened before. And that's false. <laughs> tornado season is not getting longer and nor, uh, you know, Mississippi's never had tornadoes before. Wrong. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's like that's madness and 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 easily refuted. So they did they do the same thing with hurricanes, right? On the top, uh, you know, coming on the tails of last season's hurricane season, which was below average, they say, oh, we're extending the deadline to file for hurricane damage. And that's proof that hurricanes are lasting longer. Uh, you know, hurricane season's lasting longer. It's not. Once again, wrong. Uh, where is Bill McLaughlin when you need him to? <laughs> wrong! <laughs> Uh, <laughs> down these idiots that that make completely unsubstantiated claims that because of who they are they think you'll never you'll never check the data and because of who they are they think they don't need to check the data well and they you know it's like the easiest job in the world climate climate attribution you can pick any old topic you want and you can write an article claiming that climate change is impacting it in some way it's sure. like the, the cushiest job as a journalist in the world and they get paid I'm assuming a decent amount for it because there are quite a few very well-funded organizations that do nothing but fund climate related storytelling um, these I don't know it's frustrating it's that sharks and ice cream all over again you know I, like you know, every I time wonder, I wonder how many of them have like crystal balls or magic eight balls sitting on their desk and uh you know, they say, oh, is the climate <laughs> bad today? And they shake at the back. Oh, most definitely. Whoa. Well, yeah, but you know what? We could story. make a great novelty item. We could manufacture a Heartland version of the, the climate eight ball. ball. You know, yeah. you turn it over, you ask it any question, and it comes up, it's climate change. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, is it climate change? It's about most as useful as models. <laughs> tornadoes are getting worse. Is it climate change? Most definitely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if it somehow comes up not likely, then they'll just write an article saying that climate change is impacting the probability on a magic eight ball. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yep. I mean, yeah, the stupid, it burns. It really does out there in yeah. media land. All right. Next topic. There was another great story this week. New York City will target food choices in its battle against climate change. Their premise basically is food is creating, you know, noxious gases such as carbon dioxide and methane and other things. And, well, we'll just have to take away the food. <laughs> no, it, it, this, is, this is among the most egregious authoritarian plans at a local level that that I can imagine. I mean, I remember a few years ago when uh, when uh, Bloomberg wanted to stop people from drinking sodas and so he mandated you have uh. to have smaller soda sizes, right? And I believe the court said, you can't do that. <laughs> uh, you know, that was struck down. Um, but Mayor Eric Adams, it, crime is skyrocketing. They've lost 400,000 people in the last few years, have fled a city. They're, they're doing everything they can to try and get people to come back. At the same time as he tells you, but when you come back, uh, you're going to have to get rid of your meat and start eating some bugs, and uh, we're going to monitor your food consumption and purchases. I can't imagine a more personal, uh, you know, 
Democrats don't want government in people's bedrooms. They constantly say, we don't get government out of the bedrooms, but they want them in your kitchen. <laughs> That's crazy. Yep. All right. So Linnea wrote a response to this uh, on climate realism, and um, it was it was just a beautiful takedown. Linnea, why don't you talk about it? Sure. So basically all of the premises that he bases his, or Mayor Adams, that is, bases his position on are false. Um, I guess the, the uh, Gothamist story kind of implied that part of his uh, passion about this issue, about eating a like vegetable based diet is because he got diagnosed with diabetes a while back and they told him that you can't eat eggs anymore or whatever, whatever it is that they tell you when your cholesterol is bad. Um, <laughs> the, so, so now he says, okay, well, that means that no one should eat any of this stuff. So he apparently keeps a vegetarian of some kind diet. And he says that any diet outside of that is carbon emissions intensive. And so therefore it has to be cataloged. So they're coming out with this, um, app or something that is going to track household consumption. And it's not just on food, it's on clothing, you know, if you buy new clothes or something. So basically the city of New York is going to track what all of the New Yorkers are eating, what they're buying, um, what they're, you know, any kind of exchange of money in the city that's going on. They're going to track it and they're going to add that to the city's carbon footprint um, cataloging service that they have online. Admittedly, yeah. this is quite a undertaking. Um, I don't know if they're counting like breathing out or anything yet, but <laughs> I, I'm not sure what they're going to do about that. But um, the main targets of this are meat and dairy. They want to limit people from consuming those like animal products. And they also want to encourage people to not eat things that come from far away. So, you know, millennials can cry, uh, no more avocado toast for you because they're not growing avocados in New York. Uh, they're probably, you know, they're probably not making, uh, not growing salmon in New York. So you're going to have to skip the lox and bagels, all that good stuff. Um, New York is world renowned for its food scene. Although I argue that uh, Houston's is pretty good too, um, but but you know they're they're well known for their you know pizza places and delis and butchers and all sorts of world class you know Michelin star restaurants and stuff. But Mayor Adams wants to limit all of that. All of these companies and all of these mom and pop businesses that depend on animal products for a huge part of their business model are going to have to make cuts by I think. 2030, he wants them to reduce their emissions impact by 25%. Um, no. That's egregious. Like if your entire business is a butcher shop <laughs> and you have the mayor coming and saying that meat products are bad and that no one should be using them anymore, well, he just is mandating your business away. That's it. Um, yeah. Delis and cheese, you know, delis too. The, the meats yeah. and cheeses are, are a huge I would I would wager the largest part of a deli uh, uh, sales, and so uh, you know he's dr he's going to drive people drive businesses out, and I, I, I'm afraid he's going to drive even a few of his uh, uh, progressive friends out because they won't be able to go to uh, to Morton's Steakhouse or whatever the <laughs> you know, Delmonico's and have a steak. Uh, you know that, that they can still go to Miami <laughs> and get the steaks. Know and you know it's hard too because you know he did get voted in. Yep. You know people want this kind of policy in New York. They're always virtue signaling about how they want, you know, to be carbon neutral or whatever. I do not think that people realize what that means at all. <laughs> I I don't think that they realize that it means that their favorite, you know, bodega is going to get shut down. Um yep. because those mom and pop places are not energy efficient. You know, they're not they're not like a Walmart or something with, uh, you know, a hyper effective use of space, a hyper effective use of electricity. They have everything kind of um, dialed in. So these small mom and pop places that New York is kind of famous for are going to be gone. 
and New Yorkers will cry and complain about it. And they'll probably blame climate change, <laughs> frankly, knowing the way this stuff goes. Um, so I, I feel bad. Um, it, this should not happen. Mayor Adams should not be doing this. But I kind of also don't feel bad. It's kind of the reaping and sowing. Um, I guess yeah. I guess my thoughts on it are, are twofold. Uh, you know, I think New Yorkers are waking up a little bit, right? On crime, they certainly are. They elected, you're right, they elected Alvin Bragg. But I saw the testimony this week, and I've seen the reports, and the people on the street are not happy with Alvin Bragg. I don't think they realize, I mean, it's only coming out now, some of the things he said when he was running. I'm going to put a fracture between the district attorney's office and the police. That's madness. Uh, I, I am not going to prosecute theft. Okay, well, how many businesses are going to go out of business for that? I'm not sure they realized just how radical he was when they elected him. And Mayor Adams talked to good games on crime. So they're, they're coming around on crime. I suspect they'll come around on climate change as well. My second thought is, I know the Constitution largely only apply, places limits on the federal government. But I think there should just be some base recognition of basic human rights across all levels of government. I don't want local governments telling people what to eat. Not nope. whether I don't care who they elect. I don't think if it was Vladimir Lenin or Thomas Jefferson as the mayor of your city, he shouldn't have the right to tell you what to eat. He shouldn't no. have the right to tell you whether you can go outside or go to church. I don't care who here it is and how local it is. They just shouldn't have that kind of authority over people's lives. We have fundamental rights. And no. I would argue that like the right to choose what what I eat is pretty fundamental. But uh, that's not the world we live in. So there you well, go. And, right. and well, you know, it'll be a black market for lox and bagels up there yeah. in New York. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, yeah, I'd like to see them make a bunch of egg-free bagels and, you know, no salmon, no cream cheese. Oh, look, Terrible. they'll have they'll have that fake they'll have that fake salmon if if it gets created. I haven't seen it yet. I've seen the fake meat. Yeah, like that fake dogs. crab you get at the salad bar. <laughs> no, yeah. no, but still that's fish. still made that's still made from <laughs> from whitefish though. Yeah. No, the fake salmon will have to be some kind of uh soy based yeah. uh, speaking of product. Uh, speaking of, of soy, you know, why don't we just simply cut through all of this and go straight to having soylent green vending machines in Times Square? <laughs> Yeah, well, and I they're on their way to that. Don't even well, I, look. Yeah, if, Al, if, if if Bragg and and Adams were on the menu, uh, maybe <laughs> I consider this diet. All right, all right, let's move on. We got one more topic to cover before we get to Earth Day. Baseball, baseball. Everybody loves baseball. That's the great American pastime, right? Well, the numbskulls that are in the media. This one, this this guy that writes for Associated Press, Seth Borenstein, is the worst. Anyway, he wrote this article. Baseball is getting more home runs because of, you guessed it, climate change. And their, their whole premise is it's getting warmer, therefore the density of the air is getting thinner, and therefore the balls will go further. What great scientific logic. There's actually a scientific paper written about this, but the scientific paper is a big candidate for Traction Watch because they ignored a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, they, they, they didn't even pay any attention to the fact that during the late 1990s into the early 2000s, there was this giant hump in, in increased number of home runs due to steroid use, you know, Barry Bonds and all of that stuff. They ignored all that. So we wrote a response on climate realism and basically skewered them and showed that, you know, this is just like everything else you guys write. It's just a big load of hooey. And uh, I, I co-authored this with Sterling. And Sterling is a huge baseball fan. And, you know, he's a purist on lots of things. And he provided some fantastic insight. So, Sterling, I'm going to let you run with this one. Yeah, you know, we discussed this a little bit last week, but it, it is pretty egregious. Um, look, in any scientific study, I don't care what it is. In a scientific study, if you're if you're projecting things, if you're trying to attribute things, you control for other factors, right? It's it's common to control for other factors, so you can tease out just what can be attributed to your factor. Did they control for stadium size? No. Almost every stadium they looked like looked at. Well, they looked at all the stadiums. 
uh, almost uh, they looked at all the teams. Almost every team, except for a couple, have new stadiums. To a stadium, every one of them is smaller. You know, has fences that are closer in than the older stadiums, or the same size. In some stadiums, not only are the fences closer in, but they've lowered the walls, so no more balls go over the fence. Uh, let's look at another few other factors. They over the time period they studied, they added at least six new teams to baseball. Right when the home runs started spiking, well, how does that affect home runs? Well, pitching gets diluted. You have to call up younger pitchers, less seasoned pitchers to pitch against major league hitters. And uh, you call up uh, or you keep around some older pitchers who are past their prime, but still pretty decent. But so you've got worse pitching, you've got smaller stadiums and uh, uh, well, then you've got the steroids, which were a huge factor. And uh, there, there, there were some other factors, but it's like, all sorts of these confounding factors, they didn't account for any one of them. No, and it's a classic case of correlation is not cor uh, causation. You know, they went and just say, hey, look, baseball home runs are going up. It must be climate change. That is look, the level of thought that went into this. So they, they, they didn't they, look at They tried else. to put a scientific pistache on it with the air pressure and stuff like that. But even even what they came up with, the number of home runs that they attributed to climate change, were like beneath the margin of error. It was it was 500 additional home runs over more than a decade. Yeah. Well, right. uh, home runs went up, you know, thou you know thousands over the decade. You know, and 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 what really tells the tale is, so they showed the air pressure going down, they showed the temperatures going up, and guess what? The temperatures went up and the air pressure went down, even as uh, the steroids were caught and the home runs dropped dramatically. So that yep. tells you there was another effect going on. It, it had nothing to do with, uh, uh, you know, Anthony looked at it and found that some of the stadiums had put up stuff to block wind. So it fewer balls would drift into the foul lines. Right. Here's one it, of the interesting things. This this graph from the EPA, if yeah. in fact the number of home runs was directly tied to temperature, we would have seen a huge spike in home runs during the Dust Bowl years when temperatures were much hotter than today. Didn't happen. Didn't, didn't happen. happen. Well, so, the funny thing is, you know, the study itself admits that there are, you know, probably all those, all of these other, you know, factors are a larger impact on the home run issue than climate. But of course, what the media lasers in on is the climate angle, because that's what they put in their headline and in their abstract, because it's what gets funding, I would assume. I'm not really sure why they all do this. Um, but it, it was, you know, a relatively innocuous report on its own, I thought. Um, kind of goofy. Uh, but the fact that, you know, the, the scientists never come out and say to the media, like, hey, you guys took this a little farther than appropriate. Um, they never do that. They always well, I don't, just let them run with it. I, I, right. I just didn't see. I, I looked at the study. I didn't see where they actually accounted for these other factors at all. They didn't account they, they, for they them. Referenced, they, they referenced, oh, yeah. well, there's some other things going on. Steroids are there. But that's not, you know, that's not the story. It's like, this is just one more story. And I say story, not scientific, uh, you know, not scientific research. This is one more story where it, if it happened, climate change is to blame because it doesn't matter what the what the phenomenon is. Climate change is to blame more. Home, now, of course, someone like me who, uh, though a purist and I'm not keen on some of the rule changes, uh, a purist likes home runs and doesn't like well pitched games. <laughs> it, this is one of those things is. If climate change is contributing to more home runs, I'm going, hey, hooray for climate change. Uh, I like I like high scoring games with a lot of action. Um, I don't think climate change is having that effect. But uh, I think a lot of people would look at this and say, well, if that's climate change, well, that's that's one you mark up to the benefit side, not the not the uh, drawbacks. Right. Right. I prepared this graph here where I took the two graphs that they had on the original scientific paper and overlaid them, which they didn't do. 
And I think they didn't do it for a reason. But when you overlay them, you see the very clear spike in home runs during the steroid era. And then right after that, the correlation between temperature and home runs goes completely out of phase. Well, when your correlation goes completely out of phase, that just proves your premise right there. But they didn't talk about that. Anyway, I've also sent this paper, I sent this paper to Retraction Watch, hoping that they will put enough pressure on the journal to retract it, because this is just garbage science. The only way you could ever link home runs and climate change might be with the Chicago Cubs. Anything else is completely off the table. <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. All right, next How topic. Well, How dare you? One more, one more thing about that. You know, another fact that we we discussed in the paper, but we didn't really uh, discuss here. Um, there's something called, I, I, I never heard about this until a few years ago, and I watch baseball. They constantly prattle on. You know, I hear about analytics all the time. Analytics, analytics, analytics. Oh, you got to do these analytics. Uh, and one of the analytics, one of the things they really care about is launch angle. You know what? I never once heard the word launch angle when I was a kid. Through the 70s, through the 80s, through the 90s, nothing about launch angle. Now launch angle is everything. Why? The higher the launch angle, the more home runs. And so hitters are awful nowadays. They can't hit the opposite way. They don't hit for average. Why? Because they're all focused on hitting home runs because that's what gets them the rewards. Uh, and so analytics says focus on launch angles. If you don't, if your launch angle, we need to work on that in the batting cage if it's not high enough. Well, okay. If that's what you reward in baseball, you will get more of it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So the next topic is Earth Day. You know, Earth Day's coming up tomorrow. We've had Earth Day since what, 1972, I guess it's been. And, um, you know, there's been a lot of predictions that have been made around Earth Day that year. They never came true. You know, you can remember all the predictions that were screamed about, you know, the famine, the population bomb, all the stuff from Paul Ehrlich, Ehrlich uh, you know, climate change. It's almost a universal truth with the left that they just will find anything and beat your head with it to say that there's disaster in your future unless you listen to us. And listening to them typically means you've got no or less freedom. That's the problem that we've got in general with the way that the left deals with anything related to the environment. If you don't listen to us, things are going to get bad. Disasters on the horizon. It's been this way forever. So I got an email this morning to commemorate um, Earth Day from Southwest Airlines. I'm a member. I have you know frequent flyer miles there. Celebrate Earth Day and then some. Our whole premise, well... Do less flying. <laughs> Pack intelligently. Earn some bonus points for being a good climate citizen. All of that stuff. You know, Southwest, which went through a big meltdown in, in um, December, you know, when they had that Christmas meltdown when all their computers quit. I'm surprised that wasn't blamed on climate change. Um, but they give some helpful tips in this next graphic about how to pack your clothes. I mean, you, Sterling, you talk about going to, you know, telling you what to eat. Now they're telling you how to pack your suitcase. Yeah. You know, pack intentionally to reduce aircraft weight and save on fuel. Go paperless. I, know, look, I, I, I pack intentionally for a completely different reason. I get my first bag on fleet free. If I go over, I pay. <laughs> they don't need to tell me. It has nothing to do with saving the earth or saving fuel. It has to do with me saving money. Now, if they start charging me more, you know, if they start opening, well, we've, we're going to open your bag now and see that you packed uh, intelligently and they decide that they haven't and I'm going to get charged, then me and the airlines are going to have a pretty serious uh, problem here because it's none of their business. Uh, right. You know, and it's not just the airlines. Um, look, Earth Day was founded at a time when um, for 70 years or, or thereabouts, the government had contributed to the destruction of the environment. Before the progressive era, property rights protected the environment. You could stop pollution in a river by saying it affected my cattle. And then they just, they didn't, they didn't say we're going to find the factory that's doing this, or we're going to set allowable limits. They said, no, you have an absolute property right to have your cattle not be killed 
by pollution. And they would shut the factory down. And businesses said, oh, we can't have that. We got to have progress. The mayor said, we got to have progress. This is jobs. And so they got the legislatures to start changing the law. And uh, so the common law was replaced by positive law. We had 70 years or 80 years of pollution, government-sponsored pollution. Uh, and then when they shot, and then they're shocked when they've caused the problem. Oh my gosh, it's it's like uh uh it's like the cop in Casablanca saying, uh, I'm shocked to find gambling going on in this place. And then the the mayor D comes back, sir, we have your winnings and go, thank, thank you very much. Uh so government creates the problem, and then their solution is ever bigger government. What they don't recognize before they created the EPA, before we settled that body to Earth Day, is that some states had already started acting. And in those states that had started acting, air pollution was going down at a faster rate than uh, it went down after the EPA become involved. In the end, there were pollutants, uh, and they have declined dramatically. And our air is safe now. And our water yeah. is largely safe now, unless the government goes and breaches a mine and pollutes an entire river like they did in Colorado a couple of years ago. Oh, we're going to clean up this mine that's closed. Uh and so they breach the, the dam that's holding all the stuff in and it flows right into the river. But then the, the government's not at fault. Uh, that's the that's the company that, that built the dam and kept the stuff in. Um, they've created these problems, but we've solved most of them. Air is cleaner, water's cleaner. Um, we've gotten the big things out of the way. And so because the government, because the EPA needs a reason to exist, a, a continuing reason to exist, they get into more esoteric smaller and smaller amounts of pollution where there's no evidence it's harming us different areas of your life uh where the, where there's no evidence that it's needed and and you know not just the EPA you know Lene and I wrote and I'll, I'll go hand it off to Linnea, but we wrote about the Department of Energy all these rules look on earth day do you think that it saves the environment for the government to tell you <laughs> what your air conditioner can be like your furnace your stove uh, your light bulbs. Uh, is that really, uh, I've read the constitution. This is the federal government. Mm -hmm. I've read the constitution. I don't see it in there that they have the power to tell you what appliances go in your home. Right. And uh, it, it's kind of like a green hypochondria, right? Like they're, they're convinced there's always something that you need to fix. There's like some invisible germ in the air and it is, always present and there's always something you can do to make it better. So it's like the thing with the PM 2.5. PM 2.5, they try to connect this very fine particulate matter to any number of um, ailments and they have yet to do it completely conclusively. And basically the like gas stove thing, the way that they proved that was they cranked up a gas stove in a room that was completely sealed with plastic. And then they said, oh, your gas stove is going to kill you. No, you lunatics. This is uh, the concentration matters, but they don't seem to realize that. Or if they do, they're hiding it. Um, it's, it's, it's insanity. And it really it has nothing to do with protecting the environment. Our environment today is cleaner than it's been in, I don't know, like, a hundred years. Uh, it's, right. it's spectacular. We're spectacularly well off. Um, we could be turning our attention to trying to help people to progress and to develop um, the way that we did so that we can boost all countries' environmental quality by boosting uh, or by removing their poverty level. Because one of the factors that seems to correlate most strongly with um, environmental degradation is poverty not fossil fuel use. So it's yep. Well, all of these, these mandates. I mean, telling you, you know, that your light bulbs are not efficient enough when we've already had the efficiency standards raised to near obscene levels at this point. I mean, they basically, the new regulations that they've come out with basically remove all of the light bulbs from the market, except for a select few types of LEDs. Um, hmm. It's, yeah. They've gone way too far and they don't care. They know it. Um, this stuff is, it's just a matter of like, I, 
I'm kind of struggling here because I want to call them communists because. Oh, go ahead. Um, it's all right. Because They're authoritarians. They're authoritarians. <laughs> because the the thing with communism was always that, you know, there's very little choice in the Soviet Union. You have like one brand of cereal and it's just a blank box that says cereal on it. You have one brand of milk, you have one light bulb, and that's kind of what they're going for with these new efficiency standards. You have right. just a couple of laundry machines that you're allowed to have. You have just a couple of washers that you're allowed to have. You have just a couple of light bulbs that you're allowed to have. And, and I'm not anti-LED yeah. light bulb. I, I have some really cool ones that like turn on by themselves without... You know, they have like a little light sensor in them so that I don't have to constantly forget to turn the switch on and off uh, from my patio. But it's so it's not like the technology is bad that they're pushing, but it's the pushing the technology at the expense of all other technology, banning your right. ability to choose other products. That's where it gets gross. Well, right. and, and we'll yeah, end up with an electric Trabant eventually. You know, the Trabant was the, the, anyone know about the Trabant? It was the car of East Germany. You know, it was your only choice and you had to wait like anywhere from two to five years to get one. And the thing ran on a, on a two cycle engine, basically a lawnmower engine. It polluted terribly. It ran terribly. It leaked. It rattled. It rumbled. It was a piece of junk. And that was the best that socialism or communism in East Germany could produce. It, it, here's the here's let's look at just two of the things that uh, Biden has proposed co coming on Earth Day uh, that are really egregious. So just a month and a half, two months ago, it leaked that the administration was considering banning gas stoves, and there was a huge backlash. Right? Oh no, we're not going to ban gas. We never intended that. That's Republican disinformation. All the while. The agency, the Department of Energy, was writing a rule that bans uh, some all but four models of gas stoves. And they're not the cheapest models of gas stoves. They're the ones that your commercial chefs, they want to keep uh, Gordon Ramsay and, uh, and the celebrity chefs happy. So they'll keep some gas stoves on the market. Those are the ones they can afford, not the ones you and I can afford. Not the ones average folks can afford. So uh, they are banning gas stoves. And why? Well, initially, the initial claim was, oh, well, it, no, the indoor air, it's causing bad indoor air. And then study after study, they you point to, and it's like, no, it's not causing bad indoor air. So they say, oh, well, we're saving you money. You, you can always tell, you can always tell a flim-flam man when he starts shifting the justification for what he's trying to sell you. And so they went from, it's, it's bad for your health, to, oh, we're going to save you money. And then we looked at, you know, then people looked at it and says, yeah, it'll save you, what, 150 a month? A year. Uh, 150 a year over the life of the appliance. I'm sorry, let me have what I want. Uh, I'll pay the extra 150 a year. Uh, and then they came out shortly thereafter um, with the gas, with the, with the car ban, right? Internal combustion engine. We're going to get, he would remove uh, more than 60% of the cars on the market today, including yeah. all but one of the top 10 cars sales by sales. F-150, Ford F-150 pickup truck, top seller in the U.S. for uh, maybe 20 years, maybe 40 years. Um, the second best seller, Chevy Silverado last year. The third best seller, Ram last year. Five of the top 10 sales Last year were pickup trucks. Two were large SUVs. Not a single one of them will survive under Biden's ban. This is not no. about helping you save money because all the ones they would replace it with are more expensive. It's not really about saving the environment because there's no evidence that these emissions are destroying the environment. It's about controlling your life, telling you how to live, making you ride in mass transit. And it's going to backfire for the environment because a lot of people are just going to keep their older cars on the road. People aren't going to give up their Ford F-150s. You can still see some driving around from the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s. They're now selling at auction for huge sums of money. Well, they'll just keep the ones from the 90s and the 2000s going. We'll look like, uh, we'll look like Cuba. 
Yeah. But, yeah. Okay. So I want to move on to the next topic. Now, the one of the most interesting things that's come out of the left and the uh, the green movement, you know, is solar panels and wind energy and so forth. And we've talked about this on a regular basis. And their whole belief system is that we're going to be able to power everything with solar and wind. The problem is, is that they didn't do the math from the get-go. They just went on with the vision. And guess what? This week, a study came out that says trillions of dollars have been invested in solar panels on the assumption it has a low carbon footprint. However, according to the study, new evidence reveals that most solar panels may emit four times more life cycle CO2 emissions than reported. Oops. Gosh. Now what? <laughs> and then there's the disposal problem. Solar panels like this only last about 20, 25 years before their efficiency starts dropping. What are we going to do with all of those things? Bury well, unless, unless you put them in places where hurricanes come through and then their their life cycle drops off even faster. <laughs> but when roofs get swept away with solar panels or when rocks are thrown through them, uh, it didn't last. Where's that audio coming from? Not on my end. Ah. I guess it's Linnea. We, Can we've, you hear we've me? taken Linnea out of the queue until she figures out what her audio problem is. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. So you know that's probably due to climate change that, that happened, right? Oh uh, yeah. Well, almost certainly, uh, it it affected her indoor air quality. The, you know, her atmospheric carbon dioxide levels inside went went up too high and. Uh, it feared it interfered with the radio waves or whatever, how huh? or Wi Fi, right? Yeah, Wi Fi and climate change, you know, that's going to be the next big thing, you know. Um, anyway, Linnea, unmute your microphone and see if we've got your audio back. Yeah, still there, still there. So, you've got some kind of a connection problem, most likely. It sounds like uh, a connector is not solid or something like that, but in any event. Uh, so let's go on to the next topic. There was a, a study that came out this week, or not a study, but a survey from the Pew Center. Mm. The Pew Center, they go out and they do all kinds of surveys on Americans and so forth. And they compiled some data that says what Americans' views of climate change are. And it's pretty interesting. Of course, they've got a nice picture there of people holding up solar panels, protesting, we need more solar, you know. They don't have a clue about the fact that the CO2 footprint is much larger than they've been told, of course. Anyway, the majority of Americans support becoming carbon neutral by 2050. But I don't think the most Americans understand what that really means. Just like the people holding up these solar panels in the protest don't understand that there's really a hidden thing in the background about solar panels and carbon footprint. I don't think most Americans really understand what carbon neutral means or will mean to their lifestyle. Uh, they just think things are going to go on a hunky dory and it's going to be rainbows and unicorns while we have clean energy. No, it means that we're going to have less energy, less freedom, less choice. Well, that's I what's coming. I think the poll also showed that the majority of people didn't want to get rid of uh, fossil fuels and, and internal combustion engines. Uh, so somehow they think, um, somehow they think that you can go carbon neutral and still be burning fossil fuels. I don't see it. <laughs> uh, and, and neither does the IPCC or, or all the other agencies. They think you got rid of, got to get rid of fossil fuels. So, there's a cognitive dissonance here. We want to be carbon neutral, but we don't want to give up the uh, the technologies that would allow us to be carbon neutral. And there was another poll this week um, that was even more interesting because it uh, it was conducted by the Associated Press, University of Chicago, and a couple of other groups. Yeah, here's I, I can't see that, but I think that says. Uh, I think that's the one that shows they don't want to get rid of fossil fuels. They want to keep. Right. It is. Um, 
But uh, the other poll showed that actually the number of people who were concerned about climate change fell below 50%. It, it has declined across independents are below 50%. Republicans remained below 50%. And Democrats had fallen from, uh, they're, they're still above 50%. But the average, uh, even among Democrats, it had fallen. And it also shows that a majority of uh, people now don't think humans are primarily responsible for climate change. Uh, and then when it got into the details, and this was the interesting one, it showed that they wouldn't pay 62% yeah. of the public would not pay a dollar a month to fight climate change. If you raised it to $10 a month, it, uh, I, once again, I can't see it, but I, I know it's it, it falls even farther. But 20% of the public said they'd be willing to pay $100 a month. Now, if you look at uh, demographic data, you find out that 20% of Americans, about 20% of Americans, earn over $150,000 a year. I'll wager that almost every one of the people who said they'd pay $100 a month were in the top income categories. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Um, so, you know, the bottom line is, is that people don't really understand what they are endorsing. You know, they think that climate change is bad, that, that it's going to affect the future because they've been told so by the media with all kinds of ridiculous stories and pronouncements from activist scientists like Michael Mann and his hockey stick and Al Gore and his, you know, bogus claims and inconvenient truth. But what the bottom line is, is that people don't really understand if we go to a net zero economy, you know, by 2035 or 2050, or whatever the date is going to be, things are going to be really bad. We'll be back to you know, having things like energy rationing. They th remember the, the gas lines from the 1970s, you know, when that whole OPEC thing happened? Well, that's going to be even worse, you know, under this coming change. Okay, here's the graph. Here's the poll that, that Sterling was talking about. Fewer than half of Americans are supportive of a monthly carbon fee. Yeah. They don't want to pay for it. I don't want to pay for it. Do you want to pay for it? Not me. Yeah, and, and and as it goes up, the, the the numbers fall even more dramatically, and uh, and this is not an outlier poll, by the way. This is not some oh well, but that's just one poll. No, poll after poll after poll. When when people are asked how much they're willing to pay to fight climate change, it's always almost nothing. The majority for for the vast majority, it's almost nothing. They don't want your their taxes on their gases. They don't want fees on their electric bills, and so. When they ask the question, uh, well, do you support wind power? Uh, oh, yes, we support that. If they frame the question, if we add more wind power to the electric grid, it will add X number of dollars to your electric bill. Do you support it? I, I have a feeling the decline in support for wind power would be dramatic. If you did the same thing with solar, adding solar to the electric grid will add X number of dollars to your electric bill every month. Do you support it? I have a feeling it would fall dramatically. Yeah. And one of the craziest things is that in California, PG&E has this program where you can, if, if you can't put solar or wind on your home or worry business or whatever, you can buy into a solar program where you can pay an extra 20 to $50 a month and get the benefits of having solar right there in your very home. Just pay the money. Problem is, and even Michael Mann fell for this. He says, I've got one of these programs where I pay to get solar. Electrons don't follow the rules of transmission based on what they are. There are no green electrons versus dirty electrons. You can't get green electrons delivered to your house. Ugh, it's insane. Anyway. Linnea, are you static free now? Can you unmute there and see if we can hear you? Hey, you're all right. Clean. I didn't do anything, so I don't know what that was. But uh, yeah, no, and I this stuff, is, especially the solar thing. I a friend of my of mine asked me recently, why wind and solar? Why not nuclear? Why do they focus so hard on the wind and solar issue when you could put up? you know, a couple of new nuclear plants that are with the latest technology um, and it'll be expensive, but not, you know, 
as wildly expensive as people try to frame it as. And you could provide, you know, pretty consistent power. You would still probably need natural gas and coal um, because nuclear is kind of hard to ramp up and ramp down. But it's a really good energy source that we've been using for a long time. And France has been very successful with it. So why not? And I kind of, it's hard to wrap your head around, uh, especially if emissions are the problem. And a lot of the people who are from the kind of nuclear scare age will say that they're worried about, um, you know, throwing out or disposing of uh, the fuel rods and stuff. But that really hasn't been the problem that people who are alarmist about nuclear have made it out to be either. So why wind and solar? They don't even like hydro anymore. And the only answer that I could come up with was maybe all of the oversight that required that is required to build something like a nuclear plant or like a hydro plant is harder to funnel money through <laughs> than right. putting up a billion little wind turbines in different places or a billion little solar installations, all these small companies doing it. Maybe it's a little bit easier to use it as a little bit of a get rich quick, get your subsidies and get out sort of a thing um, than putting real effort behind putting in a major installation like a nuclear facility. Uh, because the wind and solar stuff, it's, you know, mind-blowing that those yep. are their go-tos when they are literally the worst options you can pick besides, you know, I don't know, hamsters yeah. running on wheels or something. You know, you can blame Jane Fonda and a movie called The China Syndrome for the fear of solar, uh, pardon me, the fear of nuclear. Um, it put, uh, really, it put the fear of God in a lot of people when that movie came out. And then there was Three Mile Island that happened. And so nuclear, even though its track record for safety is really very good, just scared the bejesus out of a lot of people because of those two things that happened. Okay, we're going to go on to some questions now. We've had some questions come in from commenters, and you can, of course, ask your own questions here. First one, what percentage of CO2 that's put into the atmosphere is put there by humans? 1%, 2%, 3%? Well, we happen to have a graphic for that on climate realism, or pardon me, Climate at a Glance, our website. Uh, our most recent story, actually, is all about that. And I'm going to send this over to Andy so he can bring it up on the screen. And... Um, Basically, there it is. He's got it. So here's the answer right here. Climate at a glance. What percentage is there? Well, it's actually just 3.4% of all the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has been contributed by humans. And the percentage of warming is even less. The human contribution to warming is just 0.28%. Scroll down, Andy. There's some great graphics there that'll explain all of this. Keep going. Keep going. There we go. Further down. Breakdown right there. 3.4% are human of all the CO2 in the atmosphere. That's not a lot. Human versus naturally produced CO2 in the atmosphere. But the next pie chart just below this one talks about how much warming does human activity create. And when you break that down, just... 0.28%. Yet, you know, we're throwing billions of dollars at things like solar and wind and everything else in an effort to reduce this. It's madness. Well, on the same graphic you had earlier, Andy, uh, I mean, Anthony, uh, though it said greenhouse gases, as a percentage of greenhouse gases, our contribution is even smaller, right? Because mm -hmm. CO2 is only a small part of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Yep. Yeah. All right. Do we have any other questions of interest out there since we've tackled this one quickly? Whatever happened to the lowest, lower troposphere tropical hotspot? Well, nothing happened to it. It never showed up. <laughs> it never arrived. It was one of those model predictions out there. It says, you know, we're going to see this signature in the atmosphere, in the lower troposphere. And that's proof of climate change. That was all based on models. It never showed up. So there you go. Next question. If they go to net zero, what will the level of energy look like? Well, I'd pretty uh, close to zero too. Well, no, yeah, what it'll look like. We've there have been analysis that uh, that look at this, and it finds out that it'll be the energy use that we were using in the 1820s to 1840s. If you like the lifestyle you were living back then, except except it'll have to be lower, right? 
uh, because the population is much, much larger than it was then. Right. So you'd have to go back to probably the mid to early 1700s for our energy use to be net zero. Yeah. When I think about how life was back then. You had horse-drawn carriages. You had, you know, horse manure in the streets. They actually had a... Equal... No indoor plumbing. That's the one that gets me. I'll live, I can live with a horse. No indoor plumbing? Nah, I'm not doing that. Oh. Uh. Are. No Next refrigeration, no, no, no refrigeration. <laughs> so your, uh, your food spoils. You, 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 of course I hunt, so, uh, I'd be okay, but. Thanks uh, Matt. We appreciate it. <laughs> He's some, some heroes don't wear capes. Uh, you know, these guys, here's the thing. When I read this paper and I know Sterling came to the same conclusion, when we read this scientific paper about baseball and home runs and climate change, it was clear that these guys didn't know jack about baseball. Not yeah. one bit. Yeah. They knew, they knew a lot about maybe air pressure and temperature and how it relates. Uh, and then they tried to correlate that with uh, its impact on the ball, you know, on the balls. And yet, as far as I can tell, they didn't even do an analysis of the different uh, uh, as as a baseball fan knows, the balls are constantly being changed themselves. Uh, if if uh, if home runs go up too much in one year, there's constant worry that, oh, the balls are being juiced. And so we've got to do something about it. So the next year they have a different formula for the balls that are produced. Uh, they yeah. didn't look at any of that. Nope. Nope. They ignored it. They uh, they had a, a bad case of um, cherry picking. One, yeah. One All right. Last question. Change. Yeah. Crazy theory. I question the accuracy, but electric vehicles weigh more than gas cars. Could electric cars cause garage collapses? Yes, actually, they could. I mean, um, I think there was a story this week about New York City and a garage collapse, and it started bringing up that question about electric cars and garages. You know, it's particularly in the inner cities because that's where electric cars are the most popular. People that live in Wyoming don't want electric cars because you can't get from point A to point B in Wyoming in the winter in an electric car. But inner city transfers, yeah. yeah. Electric well, it's cars also... Are... What's that? It's also the case that, you know, look... In Wyoming, you don't have a lot of parking garages, and the ones that you do have are probably newer. What they looked at in places like New York is a lot of these parking garages are older parking garages. They were built decades ago, and uh, so they've, you know, anything wears out. They've weakened over time, uh, and now you're adding more and more weight. Um uh, so, yeah, it could cause parking garages to collapse, uh, especially older park garages in the cities where electric vehicles are most likely to be parked. Yeah, yeah. So we've covered a lot of topics today. We've, we've talked about how bad the media is. We've talked about how bad they do science with baseball and climate change. We've talked about, gosh, Earth Day, everything under the sun, literally, here on episode number 60 of Climate Change Roundtable. I want to thank you for joining us, and I want to thank you for uh, tuning in today and asking all those interesting questions on number 60, the Fake and Bake Earth Day edition. Oh, and one last thing. Since tomorrow is Earth Day, please, tomorrow night, go out and turn on every one of your lights just to show how great life is with electricity. <laughs> right? All right. For Linnea and for Sterling, I'm Anthony Watts, Senior Fellow for Environment and Climate at the Heartland Institute, wishing you a good weekend and a good Earth Day. <laughs>